dead works of rebellion so that you can serve Him in righteousness and holiness with reverence and fear all the days of your life. Not constantly falling back into the pig pen. So you have this free gift offered to you. Remission of your past life. A new start. A fresh, wipe the slate clean. Like it talks about in Ezekiel. Those things will not be remembered against you again. But you must abide in that state in faithfulness to God. All freely given to you. Hope of eternal life. Remission by the blood. The exceedingly great and precious promises. All that. And you remain in bondage to sin. I mean, what's the, sometimes I wonder what's the difference between what the church is preaching. The fake churches and what these guys on the street are preaching. That people never seem to come out of sin. Because like I said, I never once heard anybody out there tell, telling people that faith upholds and establishes the law. I never once heard them say that faith worketh by love and purifies your heart by obedience to the truth. I never once heard any of those guys say that the old man must die in repentance before you can be redeemed. See, that's what I say. I, I never heard that. No, they say you've got to get water baptized or you, you've got to trust in Jesus or uh, you've got to repent. And repent means you've got to agree with God you're a sinner. No, repent means you've got to come clean with God, folks. I don't care what it means to change your mind. Well, if you change your mind, you're going to change your conduct. With exceedingly great and precious promises, he says, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What more could you possibly want? All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which he has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. The whole purpose of this dynamic of faithfulness to God with the grace of God appearing to all men in the redemption that's in Christ Jesus with the forgiveness of past sins is to be redeemed from every lawless deed to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust you're not going to be able to add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge and knowledge self-control to perseverance and godliness and the rest of it as he goes on to say because there won't be any motivation to do that because the provision takes care of it you see what I'm saying? If you believe in some kind of replacement theology, wh whichever side you're on, the, the, the paid-for penal model that's really horrible, or the governmental model of satisfaction. See, it all takes care of it. If, if it never seems to happen, you never come to the point where you make your calling and election sure so your entrance into the kingdom will be assured, well, then it's a secondary to whether or not you're ever faithful to him to begin with. And you're in that never-ending cycle of sin, confess, sin, confess, that you never seem to get out of. So this is what happens in redemption. Through those exceedingly great and precious promises. You're not doing this alone, on your own. The Spirit is there convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit is there influencing and convicting your heart, accusing your conscience, your natural moral conscience that accuses or excuses you of wrongdoing, like the Bible teaches. Man's not born a sinner. Man's not born with a depraved nature. There's nothing depraved in his flesh other than his own lust that he won't crucify. In Christ, those in Christ have crucified their flesh with its passion and lust. And it nail, nails through their fingers, their hands and feet. That would be ridiculous. There's no advantage against the indulgences of the flesh to do that like monks and, and other people in the world do, whoop them themselves and causing blood to come out of their skin. It has nothing to do. It has no advantage against the indulgences of the flesh, only crucifying it in repentance with Christ, putting it to death. How do you do that? How do you do that? You do that by doing it. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own self. In other words, beguiling your own self. And that word beguile in that scripture in James 1.22 I just quoted, it's, it's the opposite of the legizomai. It's paralegizomai, meaning by false reckoning and reasoning, you accounted yourself righteous because you entered into a position. That's exactly what they're doing. That's why he says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not beguile yourself, he says in, Col in uh, Colossians 2.4. Let no one beguile you with enticing words. In other words, let no one falsely reckon and reason with you that you can be justified in your sins without the working dynamic of faith and repentance in this process. And you can receive the grace of God with full remission and eternal life assured no matter what you do, and you're going to enter the kingdom. Don't let anybody 
rob you of your reward in Christ, which is eternal life, by this false reasoning. That's why he talks about you receive the engrafted word. Do you lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness? Receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save your soul. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. Then he goes on to say, do not err, my beloved brethren. In other words, don't come to the point where your reason in your mind that you can be in this state of righteousness like Abraham was, or the line of the righteous here, I'll show you in a minute, in Hebrews 11, in an ungodly state. See, when the scripture talks about Abraham, it's talking about the faithfulness established in the line of the faithful in Hebrews 11. Remember, it starts out, you're justified by, I mean, I'm back to Romans. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen, and by it the elders obtained a good testimony. And then he, ta then he talks about the line of the faithful, Abel, who by faith, he says in verse 4, by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained, obtained means he accomplished a task, witness that he was righteous. You say, well, none's righteous. No one's ever right. It's a filthy rag. See, again, you've got to get that out of your thinking entirely. This righteousness that comes through a faithfulness to God is a real and genuine virtue and moral uprightness towards God that's absolutely required if you are ever to enter the kingdom because you will be judged according to your deeds done in faith. God will render to each one according to his deeds. Those who by faithful continuance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immorality, immortality will inherit eternal life. Those who are self-seeking and disobedient and do not obey the truth, indignation and wrath, Romans 2, 7, and 8. There couldn't be any scriptures, many scriptures that talk about that. It couldn't be any more plain than in Romans 2. That that is the point on which everyone will be judged. Just like Jeremiah 17, 11 says, he's going to give to each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing because he tests their mind, he tests their, their, their heart, he knows what's within, and he gives to each one according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. There's no escaping this through some process that they've invented that you can be justified in your sins by faith alone. They're liars, okay? The fake church is full of liars, deceivers being deceived. It's like a first, first, 2 Timothy 3. Deceiving and being deceived, meaning deceiving themselves and others in a form of godliness. Have it like the fig tree in Israel, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it would, what? It would never grow fruit again. It would figs, the fruit. It would grow leaves, the appearance of godliness, but it would never grow fruit. That's the modern church, apostate church. It has the appearance, the glitter, the glow of something going on, the excitement. All the rhetoric, all the excitement going on, but there's no fruit of righteousness growing. There's no good tree producing good fruit. So Abraham, well, they go to always Romans chapter 4, where Abraham is justified in his faith by doing nothing. And that's where they stop. You know, blessed is the man that worketh not, but's justified. He says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted unto him as righteousness. That's where they stop. They don't go, why this happened? See, the whole process was Abraham being in this line of Abel, Noah, talking by faith, Noah built the ark, you know, he had to do something. Abraham obeyed God. Moses went forth into the wilderness and despised the trappings of Egypt. See, that's the line of the righteous is being established in Hebrews 11, showing you what faithfulness is with faithfulness to God. So when Abraham believed God and it was accounted, established by accounting, reckoned to him righteousness, that means he was firmly established with God. Yeah, they came out of an adulterous nation, but he was not a practicer of that adult, that, uh, that uh, idolatry, I mean. He came out of an idolatrous nation, but he wasn't practicing, he was seeking after God. And isn't that the whole process, see? See, without faith it's impossible to please him he who comes to him got to believe that he is. See, that's what Abraham, he coming to God, believing that he was, there was one true God of the universe. It can't be these sticks and rocks and all these things that my ancestors worship. And that he rewards those that diligently seek him. 
And that's where we start the beginning, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, and on and on through the 